learners, I welcome you all to the lesson number three, Kondiba of secondary English course. This is a story about a blind man. Learners, after completing this lesson, you will be able to use verbs in the past tense and the past perfect tense accurately. You will be able to describe the different attributes of a person. You will be able to recognize your feelings and emotions relate to the feelings of differently abled people and find ways to support them. You will be able to critically analyze a situation and take a decision and you will be able to write a narrative piece at the end of the lesson. Before we go on to the lesson, let us discuss a few things. Now learners, who is a hero according to you? A hero can be anyone, man, woman or animal who can perform heroic deeds. We have records of a handicapped man climbing the Everest with artificial limbs. There are women like Kalpana Chawla and Sunita Williams who have created history in space. Do you also know about Laika, the brave dog who went to space? Then there are the soldiers fighting on the borders facing bullets so courageously. And there are numerous instances of dogs, cats and dolphins who have rescued people. A hero can be anyone who can perform courageous acts. Learners, now let us turn our attention to the so-called handicapped and disabled people. Who can be defined as disabled? People who may be mentally or physically impaired fall into this category. The impairment could be by birth or inflicted later due to circumstances beyond control, for example due to a disease, an accident or an ailment. A more satisfying term for people with disabilities would be differently abled people. How should society treat them? They should be treated as normal people who have strong faculties which are strong. People should empathize and not sympathize with them. However, extreme cases of mental disorders may need empathetic support and help. Learners, let us now focus our attention to the story of Kondiba. Kondiba Gaikwar was a poor blind man who lived in a certain village with his friend and his wife. His sole income was through begging. He was not born blind but had become blind at the age of eight after an attack of smallpox. This story tells us about his brave act which changed his fortunes subsequently. Now, you must read the story to find out more details. Coming to part number one of the lesson, you may read from the lines, Kondaba Gaikwar to Heard a Woman Cry. In this part of the story, we are told that Kondaba is a blind man who comes to work in Mumbai. He lived in a slum. Kondaba was just eight years old when he suffered from an attack of smallpox. It affected his eyes and he became blind. When he grew up, he realized he had to earn money for his survival. At this time, there was a terrible famine in Maharashtra. And you know what happens during famine? There is no food to eat in famine hit areas. So people try to move to other places in search of food. What did Kondiba do? Kondiba had to leave his town in Aurangabad and come to Mumbai to earn a livelihood. At first, he tried selling brooms, but luck was not on his side. Then he came to know about Mumbai citizens uh, who were very, very kind to beggars and that to blind beggars. So, he decided to sit on the roadside and beg for his bread. Meanwhile, he started living in Golibar, a slum colony in Ghatkopar, where a well-wisher Tukaram and his wife Yelenbai allowed him to share their hut. In the middle of this slum colony was a well. The water in the well was a dirty blackish green. This well was very useful to the residents of the colony. The residents had collectively worked hard to construct it a few years ago 
but due to lack of funds, they could not build a wall around it. As a result, the mouth of the well kept widening as soil and rocks on the side kept crumbling and falling in. Life carried on as usual for some time. People forgot that they had to complete the half-finished walls of the well. Kondibas would also follow his routine, going out every day to beg. He would return home after he had collected rupees 5 to rupees 6. This he would carefully put in a small gunny bag and come back home. One day, Kondiba, as usual, returned home to eat his lunch. As soon as he started eating, they heard some shouts and screams of someone falling in the well. Kondiba and Yelenbai were startled. Now, learners, come to the second part of the story. You may read from the line, Kondiba set aside to beg again. On hearing the shouts, Kondiba quickly put his foot aside and asked Ellen Bai to take him quickly to the site. They reached the spot in no time. Without wasting any time, Kondiba took off his clothes and slid into the well. Two of his friends were already paddling in the water searching for Arvind. Arvind, it seems, had fallen from a tree trunk while pulling out water. The boys did not know how to dive. Kondiba used to be a very good swimmer during his childhood. Those days, he would often play a game with his friends of picking up broken pieces of shiny pottery from the well. That was, of course, many years ago before he became blind. Since he was out of practice, he was not sure how long he would be able to hold his breath underwater. Diving underwater means the diver should be able to hold his breath for a considerable amount of time. Kondiba got into the well, floated for a while and then dived in. He kept feeling his way along the wall. When his feet touched the ground, he groped with his hands to feel a body but could not feel anything. He came up to the surface to take a breath and dive back again. The crowd was standing with bated breath, praying that Kondiba find Arvind. It was now two minutes since the boy had fallen. When his aunt saw Kondiba come out without the boy, she gave a loud wail. Why did she give a loud wail? The answer is obvious. Her hopes of seeing Arvind were going faint. Learners, let's come to the third part of the story and you may read from the line, never in all the years to beg again. Kondiba dived back into the well and again he felt along the bed of the well. The general public gave a loud cry of disappointment. Kondiba himself felt disheartened at the failed attempts. For the first time after he became blind, he wished he were not blind. Why did he miss his vision? Had Kondiba not lost his vision, would the situation be any better? The answer is no. Had he not lost his sight, the situation would not have been any better because the water was so dirty that he could not have seen anything. Kondiba was determined to find Arvind. Certainly, he could not have vanished. The third time he went in, he groped every inch to feel a body. He was extremely tired. By now, his ribs were bursting, but he could not give up. He knew he was Arvind's only hope. Just as he was about to come up again to take another breath, he felt something soft among the weeds. He could feel Arvind's legs. Kondiba's heart was beating painfully by now. But this was not the time to give up. But he needed something to pull the body out. He was wondering what to do when he felt his belt. Holding it tightly with his hand, he pulled Arvind out of the net of weeds. Kondiba's weak body did not have the kind of strength that was needed, but his mind and spirit kept egging him on. Without losing his hope and his hold, Kondiba was finally 
able to pull Arvind out of the well. Kondiba was so dreadfully tired that coming up the six meters seemed like ages. As soon as he came up, his tired body gave way to exhaustion. His eyes closed and he fainted. In his near unconscious state, he could faintly hear people trying to revive Arvind by giving him artificial respiration. When Arvind vomited water, there was a cry of joy. He was rushed to a hospital. But Kondiba still clung to the sides of the well, half unconscious. Just then, a man helped Kondiba out of the well. And a woman patted him on his shoulder. Yelenbai led him to the hut. Kondiba ate his half-finished lunch and went to sleep. Kondiba had indeed saved a very precious life. He was satisfied with his efforts, but then life had to go on as normal. In his case, he had to go on with his profession of begging. So by afternoon, he had resumed his daily routine. It is believed that good work never goes waste. This was exactly what happened in Kondiba's life too. Let us see what happened, learners. By this time, word about his bravery was going around. The local newspapers carried his pictures and carried stories of his bravery. The news reached the governor and the chief minister of Maharashtra too. He was presented with the bravery awards worth rupees 12,970. Kondiba had become a hero. The government gave him a home in a blind home where he was taught skills of bottling and weaving chair seats. Having acquired these skills, Kondiba moved to Jalna, a town near his native village. He got married and started a small business of his own. Finally, the dream of a beggar who hated begging was fulfilled. He was now a small-scale businessman and could live with dignity. His days of begging were now history. Learners, I hope you have enjoyed and understood this story well. Now, let us review some of the important social messages that the story highlights. A brave and courageous act makes one a hero. Mind is superior to the body. With a strong and determined mind, one can conquer the avarice too. Kondiba proved when his body was failing him. His mind was urging him not to give up. A disability does not debar one from living a normal life. Never give in to handicaps. Sharpen your other skills. Society and government should help rehabilitate the differently abled through proper training. Under the right to education, schools are not only providing facilities to accommodate any child but are following the policy of inclusive education, which means that the differently able students are being treated as normal students. For those students who need specialized educated schools are providing such facilities too that no one is left out. Now learners, this lesson also has a few other sections of grammar. The first one describing words. A describing word can either be an adjective or an adverb. Adjectives describe nouns and pronouns. Adverbs describe verbs. Describing words give us more information about people and places and make our writing more interesting. Adjectives are describing words that tell more about nouns and pronouns. A noun names a person, place, thing or idea. A pronoun is a word that takes the place of a noun. Adjective answers some question. What kind? Which one? How many? What kind? The tall man. Tall is the kind. The mean officer. Mean is the kind. A solid ice cube. Solid is that kind. A great vacation. Great is the kind. A five-year-old child. Five-year-old, again kind. An unhappy woman. Unhappy, that is the kind. Coming to how many? Some pillows. Again, some denotes how many. Few rupees. Few denotes how many. Three pencils. Three denotes 
how many many books many denotes how many several years and like this 15 minutes which one the next one is which one that machine this notebook those girls these eggs that giraffe this controller so this that those these indicate which one category of adjective when two or more objects are being compared there are two types of adjectives used to describe their relationship these two types of describing words are called comparative and superlative comparative describing words compare only two subjects the word than is usually used with the comparative adjectives the suffix er is usually on the end of the comparative adjectives sometimes the suffix ier is used when a two syllable adjective ends in the letter y otherwise we use the word more for example shweta is richer than somya richer than my daughter is more talented than yours more talented than yours so more talented than using describing words in writing describing words add information to your writing it is important to learn how to use them effectively it's not good to use too many describing words in your writing most of your writing should consist of nouns and verbs and verbs that do action words good writing shows the readers what you are reading to say instead of simply telling them coming to naming words a noun is a naming word it is the name of a person place thing or state of being there are four kinds of nouns number one common noun it does not name any particular person place or thing it speaks in general about all persons places or things of the same kind for example the boy kicked the ball the plate is lying on the table number two proper noun it names a particular person place or thing for example jasuria lives in sri lanka jk rowling lives in britain coming to abstract noun it names a feeling or a state of being which has no form or shape and which cannot be seen or touched but those existence we feel and recognize for example a thing of beauty is a joy forever perseverance leads to success so over here beauty perseverance denote abstract noun collective noun it names a group of collection of persons or things taken together and treated as one for example he gave me a bunch of flowers the pride of the loins was asleep nouns can further be classified into two countable nouns and uncountable nouns coming to countable nouns nouns which can be counted are called countable nouns so these nouns can be either singular or plural some common nouns and collective nouns belong to this category for example one boy some other examples many boys a herd of elephants herds of elephants coming to uncountable nouns nouns which cannot be counted are called uncountable nouns so they are neither singular nor plural some common nouns and abstract nouns belong to this category for example some rise much happiness some nouns have no plural form they are always used in the singular form for example information some other examples traffic furniture news physics some nouns are always in the plural form for example scissors some other examples trousers spectacles etc what is a phrasal verb a phrasal verb is a verb followed by a preposition or an adverb the combination creates a meaning different from the original verb alone for example read the sentence kondiba's life had to go on in this sentence go on means continue I will give you certain examples. I need to get a new battery for my camera. To get means over here to obtain. Some more examples. Why don't we all get together for lunch one day? 
get together over here means to meet. I hope you got some understanding of phrasal verbs now. Phrasal verbs are part of a large group of verbs called multipart or multiword verbs. The preposition or adverb that follows the verb is sometimes called a particle. Phrasal verbs and other multiword verbs are an important part of the English language. However, they are mainly used in spoken English and informal texts. They should be avoided in academic writing where it is preferable to use a formal verb such as to postpone rather than to put off. Coming to transitive and intransitive phrasal verbs, some phrasal verbs are transitive. A transitive verb always has an object. For example, I made up an excuse. Excuse is the object of the verb. Some phrasal verbs are intransitive. An intransitive verb does not have any object. My car broke down. So, there is no object in this sentence. So, this is intransitive phrasal verb. Separable or inseparable phrasal verbs. Some transitive phrasal verbs are separable. The object is between the verb and the preposition. For example, I looked the word up in the dictionary. Some transitive phrasal verbs are inseparable. The object is placed after the preposition. For example, I will look into the matter as soon as possible. Some transitive phrasal verbs can take an object in both places. For example, I picked up the book. Another example, I picked the book up. However, if the object is a pronoun, it must be placed between the verb and the preposition. For example, I picked it up. Coming to past tense, in snake bite, we learnt that we use the past tense when we talk about an event that took place at a specific point of time in the past. We use the second form of the verb for the past tense. The simple past tense, often just called the past tense, is easy to use in English. If you already know how to use the present tense, then the past tense will be easy. In general, the past tense is used to talk about something that started and finished at a definite time in the past. Now, how to form the past tense in English? The main rule is that for every verb in English, there is only one form of it in the past tense. The exception is the past tense of to be. The past tense of to be, which has two forms, was and were. This is totally different from other languages such as Spanish, French, Italian, etc., where you change the verb ending for every subject. For example, the past tense of the verb want is wanted. Wanted is used as the past tense for all subjects or pronouns. I wanted, you wanted, he wanted, she wanted, it wanted, we wanted, they wanted. So, you just have to learn one word to be able to use it in the past tense. In this case, we just needed to learn the one word wanted, which can be used for all the subjects of people. Past tense regular verbs. To change a regular verb into a past tense form, we normally add ed to the end of the verb. For example, play, played, cook, cooked, rain, rained, wait, waited. Examples of sentences using regular verbs in the past tense are, last night I played my guitar loudly and the neighbors complained. It rained yesterday. So, these are some examples of using regular verb in the past tense. Now, let us revise some more grammar. Past tense. Do you remember that in the lesson, the snake bite, we learned the use of past tense? We learned that it is used when we want to describe some event or action which took place in the immediate past at a specific point in the past. There are some verbs given in the blue box. In the book, you can see that. You have to use the past tense of these verbs to complete the paragraph. Let us quickly change them to their past forms. Realize, realized, earn, earned come, came, start, started, fail, failed, hate, hated, try, 
tried. Now look up the book and read the paragraph again and fill in the blanks with a word you find most suitable. Now as I told you something about past perfect tense, as the words indicate the past tense verb is a verb which indicates a past action, but the difference between the exercise you do or you just completed and this one is that past perfect tense tells us about an action which has been completed. Usually such sentences have two verbs, action words. One which indicates what happened prior to the present action and the other obviously the latter. Now you need to study some examples from the book and the examples are did you go to the movie yesterday? Yes, but I missed the beginning. Did you buy the ticket after the movie had started? No, I had bought the ticket already. Now you need to answer some questions. What happened before and what happened later? A. Buying the ticket. B. Going to the movies. C. Start of the movie. You would have said buying the ticket and start of the movie happened first and then going to the movies. Further, you would have noticed that for actions that happened first, we used the words had plus form 3 of the verb. And for the actions which happened later, we simply use the simple past tense. Study the example which is there in your book. Mother and father left for office after I had left for school. Mother and father left, left for office after, after I had left for school. First left, later action. After linking word. Had left, first action. Had over here indicates past perfect tense. Now, you need to do exercises given in your book on your own. Coming to the next section which is there in your lesson, narrating an incident. Imagine learners that one day when you were playing with your friends, you heard the cries of a puppy. Tell a child or a friend what happened, how it happened, what you did and how you felt afterwards. Now write the description of the incident. Remember to use the past tense and connecting words or phrases. You may begin with one day when I was playing with and you may end with now it follows me everywhere. Now describing a person. To write the description of a person one may choose one or more characteristics. It all depends on the context and the purpose of a description. Number one, physical features, built, height, gait, complexion, facial features, forehead, eyes, nose, lips, etc. Number two, nature including psychological attributes and values that the person upholds. Number three, habits and expressions. Consider any given situation. Against each situation write the characteristics, physical features, nature including emotional and moral attributes habits and expression. You would focus on in your descriptions. Now learners, I will give you one exercise to do. You have moved to a new neighborhood. Your next door neighbor is very jolly and friendly. You have often interacted with him. Write a letter to your friend telling him or her about this neighbor. Now learners, try to include what I have told you. Physical features, nature including psychological attributes and habits and expressions. With this learners, I will close this video lesson on Kondaba. Prepare well for your exams. Best of luck and thank you.